Что там за черт? Матушка Россия! Какая Россия? Это Украина! Вот этот идиот, скотина. Разводи. Но Украина это Россия! Украина это Украина! Там Чехословакия, Прага! Там Словакия, Братислава! That was an Italian advertisement from 1994 for an atlas. Yet somebody must have not received the note and thought that uh, it should make the cosmonaut in the spot correct, based on the annexation of certain territories. He wanted to be remembered by history and history will have to remember him now. Unfortunately not because of that great YouTube remix. Ladies and gentlemen, I am gay, gay, gay. I like long big cocks. I am so happy, gay. I like long big cocks. We would all like to dance with him, but unfortunately, gay people or people identifying with in the LGBTQT community do not get to be so free to do so in Russia. You know, otherwise Putin would shout, "Think of the kids," and then send them to jail. The conflict between Russia and Ukraine is one that still leaves us in disbelief, yet it is the reality in which we are living in. Then, the other day, more than two weeks ago by now, I bought a magazine. Yes, I still do that, do not judge me. I bought historical miniatures and there was an ad for one of Tamiya's latest kits, a Ukrainian Leopard 2A6. I must admit, I was not expecting that. Like, I always wanted to buy a Leopard 2 kit because my collection of historical minis is a bit lacking, but this is really tempting. Anyway, in this video, I'm not going to analyze this current conflict in which Russia attempted to deny the sovereignty of Ukraine and is objectively attempted to invade Ukraine, seeing the annexation of occupied territories. Rather, this video will analyze another conflict between Russia and Ukraine, the soviet ukrainian War of 1917 to 1921, or the Ukrainian War for Independence, a war started to claim independence, a war that, much like the history prior to it, shows that Ukraine has been a nation struggling for its own independence long before 1991, and that uh, no matter what kind of maps somebody will dig out, you know, like French map from the 17th century, which actually states that Ukraine is there. Ukraine exists, and it has existed for a long time. It's a nation that uh, belongs in Europe, that deserves independence. As always, I tried my best to do as much research as I could on the topic and I will uh, keep my own personal opinion to this little segment and to the, my conclusions. And the video will try to remain as neutral and historical as possible. I hope you enjoy it. I guess it's time to start. Much like many other European nations, Ukraine has a long history, but for the topic of today's video, we need to talk about, once again, the Napoleonic Wars.
As we said in the video regarding the five days of Milan, the Napoleonic Wars awakened in many European people the spirit of being part of a nationality and a desire to create their own nation. The Ukrainian national anthem begins with the words Ukraine has not yet perished. The Polish national anthem starts with the familiar line Poland has not yet perished. The words of the Polish anthem were written in 1797 and those of the Ukrainian one were penned in 1862. So it is quite clear who influenced whom, but why so much pessimism? In both cases, Polish and Ukrainian, the idea of the death of the nation stemmed from the experience of the late 18th century, the partitions of Poland and the liquidation of the Etmanate. Like many other anthems, the Polish one was originally a marching song written for the Polish regions fighting under the command of the future Emperor of France, Napoleon Bonaparte in his Italian campaigns. Many of the Polish legionaries had taken part in Kosciuk's uprising, and the lyrics were meant to lift their spirits after the destruction of their states by partitioning powers. The song's second line asserts that Poland will not perish. As long as we are alive, by associating the nation not with the state, but with those who consider themselves its members. The Polish anthem gave hope not just to the Poles, but also to representatives of other stateless nations. Both Polish and Ukrainian activists promoted a new understanding of a nation as a democratic polity, made up of citizens, patriots, rather than a territorial state. However, where the Polish soldier saw in Napoleon a new opportunity to gain their independence in Ukraine, the objective was to achieve back those rights, lost under Catherine's reign, also guided by an envy towards the Polish nobility being offered more rights by the Russian rulers in order to avoid them joining in the rebellion. Those who had lost privilege regarded the Poles with envy. Among them were the elites of the former Hetmanate. But whereas modern Polish nationalism grew under Napoleon's wing, its Ukrainian counterpart made its first step under the anti-Bonaparte banner. Russian imperial journals began to publish the first patriotic poems written not in Russian but in Ukrainian. One of the first appeared in 1807 under the title Haha! Have you grabbed enough, you vicious bastard Bonaparte? One way or another, Napoleon was awakening local patriotism and national feelings. In Ukraine, as in the rest of Europe, language, folklore, literature, and, last but not least, history, became building blocks of a modern national identity. Following the Congress of Vienna, Russia saw recognition in its western acquisition of Poland, seizing the more liberal aspect of Alexander I's rule and ignoring more and more the Polish nobles and elite. In 1825, Russian general with Cossack's heritage revolted, requesting a constitution but the rebellion was crushed. However, five years later, in November 1830, young Polish officers and nobility revolted against the Russian authorities. In the revolt, the Polish also started promoting promises of emancipation to Ukrainian farmers. The November uprising not only mobilized Polish patriotism and nationalism, but also prompted a strong nationalist reaction from the Russian side. People of the caliber of Alexander Pushkin led the ideological assault on the Polish rebels and their French backers. One of his poems, To the Malignance of Russia, called on the French defenders of the Polish cause to leave the solution of the Russo-Polish conflict to the Slavs themselves. In the Polish intervention, Pushkin saw a threat to Russian possession far beyond the Kingdom of Poland. In his view, it was a contest for Ukraine as well. The defense of Ukraine and other former Polish possession against Western and in particular, policy influence became the leitmotif of Russian policy in the region in the decades following the uprising. At that point, the Imperial Minister of Education, Count Sergei Uvarov, formulated the foundation of the Russian Imperial identity, autocracy, orthodoxy and nationality. If the first two elements of Uvarov's triad were a traditional mark of Imperial Russian ideology, the third was a concession of the new era of rising nationalism. Essentially, what Uvarov had done was to identify the Russian nationality as the nationality of all Russians, Belarusians and Ukrainians. 
considered this way, the Western Ukrainian, mostly Catholics, and thus more tied to the Polish nobility, would still be as equal to the Russian subject, in an attempt to create a more larger common identity. Following the uprising, the Russian Empire aimed at avoiding another uprising, by pushing more and more on the new idea of Russian nationalism and the process of Russification of Ukraine. The imperial authorities set about turning Kyiv, a city of only 35,000 inhabitants that Pushkin called decrepit, in comparison with Vasov, into a bastion of empire and Russianness on the European cultural frontier. They restored Orthodox churches according to imperial taste of the time and banned Jews from the city. They built new boulevards and streets, and new names appeared on the map of the ancient city. The funding of the new university in Kyiv was an important turning point in the history of the region. The university's main goal was to educate local cadres to serve as agents of Russian influence and promoters of Russian identity. However, all this work led to unforeseen consequences. In February 1847, a student of the university denounced the existence of a secret society in the university known as the Brotherhood of St. Cyril and the Methodius. They were a group of pan-Slavic origin and believed that Ukraine was lagging behind in the development of a Ukrainian language, literature and culture, but also that it had much more to offer to the Slavic world. They envisioned Ukraine as a free republic inside of broader Slavic Union. The Brotherhood was disbanded after a year. But Russian authorities perceived it as a possible separatist danger fed by Parisian propaganda. However, while some in the authority perceived the group as a danger, others perceived them as patriots who wanted the unification of the Slavs under the Tsar. The members were sentenced to prison. While the Brotherhood did not achieve much, they had started a nation-building project, which many others would follow. While in Russia the objective was to Russify Ukraine, in the Eastern Empire another route was taken to deal with the possibility of Ukrainian uprising. The Austrians sought not to turn Ukrainians of Ruthenia in Germans, but rather allowed them a higher degree of independence and let national identity grow and expand. In fact, following the rebellion of 1848, such as the one during the Five Days of Milan, Palermo, Vienna and many other cities in the Empire, the Hungarians also risen up, demanding more autonomy and with them were the Poles. The Austrians suppressed the revolts with the aid of Russian soldiers and started replacing local Polish elites with impaired German bureaucrats. The Ukrainians were more loyal to the Empire and did not join the Polish in the rebellion since the Polish promises never mentioned the Ukrainian population or their needs in the manifestos. Thus, the leaders of the Ukrainian community swore loyalty to the Austrian Emperor, in exchange of protection against the Polish insurrection and right to control the region of Ruthenia something that we will see happen again in the future. Many Ukrainians from the Russian Empire found in Galicia a place for free expression of their national identity, especially in 1876, following defeat from both Prussia and Italy, Austria started providing concessions in most belligerent territory in order to preserve the empire. The reforms created a dual monarchy of Austria and Hungary, providing Hungary with a kingdom within the empire. Not only Hungary had achieved this status, but also Poland and Croatia. However, to the dismay of the Ukrainian community, their right had not been preserved, turning Galicia under Polish domain. The leaders of the Ukrainian movement felt betrayed. The pro absurd had been dealt with a devastating blow where Russophiles could push for a Ukrainian desire to join Russia. Russian authorities started persecuting those who questioned the idea of a Ukraine inside their great Russian nation. The Austrian persecuted those that supported the idea. Accompanying this period, in 1868, the movement of Ukrainophiles was born. Supporting the Ruthenia was indeed going to be part of another nation, but it was not going to be a greater Russia, but rather a greater Ukraine. Per me. La corazzata Kotionkin è una cagata pazzesca! With the years, and especially following the defeat in the Crimean War in 1853, Russia started the process of industrialization, building new railways and ports to improve the Russian navy and prevent another defeat. The process of industrialization led to new situations in Russia. In 1905, in St. Petersburg, 
when workers started striking requesting that the Tsar would recognize further rights to the workers and to protect them from their bosses, the Tsar, fearing that giving concession would eventually lead to revolution, ordered to open fire on the protestants. The consequence of the massacre reached Ukraine, where workers in Kyiv went on strike to protest and soon were joined by the workers of the Donbass. Villagers soon joined the city in fighting the authorities, with farmers cutting down forests owned by nobilities and attacking their mansions in the former territories of the Cossacks. The government responded with brute force, sending the army to fight off the rebellious workers and farmers. The Tsar's regime started losing consensus, and in summer, the crew of the Batachi Potenki of Ukrainian origin raised in rebellion. Once the leaders of the mutiny were executed, the sailors protested and started killing the officers. Following that, they sailed to Odessa, where they aided the protesting population raising the red flag. In October, workers of the railway went on strike, blocking the entirety of the Ukrainian and, alongside other workers, Russian railway. At this point, the Tsar provided concessions in form of the Duma, which was voted through male suffrage and no decision of the Tsar could be approved without the Duma support. Following the news, the people started and joined in a jubilation. However, the elites started blaming the Jews for all the troubles of all the classes. Thus starting the pogroms, a sad practice, which we will unfortunately hear again through the video. The practice would usually follow accusations by the leaders, pulling the blames on Jews followed by a night attack of gangs of orthodox zealots, migrant workers and outright criminals, much like in the Kyiv pogrom of October 17, where 72 people were killed, 300 injured and 108,000 Jewish houses and business were destroyed. Sorry, with the granting of rights, the situation of the revolution had managed to allow once again publications in Ukrainian started to spark a stronger national sentiment in the population in 1906. The first election of the Duma took place in 1906. The Tsar dissolved it after two months, bringing it to revolutionary and starting a new election achieving a second Duma in 1907, which lasted, however, only four months. With the dissolution of the second Duma, the revolution ended with an already declining revolutionary activity. On the other side of the border, Galicia was in a far more difficult situation. The 1905 revolution had sparked some movements in Galicia between both Ukrainians and Polish workers. However, the Polish Democratic Party started aiming at absorbing the Ukrainian population into Poland. Thus, the relations of the two groups started deteriorating to the point of no return in 1908, when a Ukrainian student killed the Polish Viceroy of Galicia. While unable to achieve independence, the Ukrainian of Galicia managed to allow Ukrainians to be taught in school and promoted their own cultural agenda. On the 28th of June 1914, a grenade explodes against one of the Kauda possession, following the Archduke Franz Ferdinand. The attempt on the life of the Archduke fails and forces the car of the Archduke in a confusing path that brings it to Gavrilo Princip. A single shot hits the Archduke and starts a chain of events which lead to the beginning of the First World War. Soon, the two sides of Ukraine found themselves fighting against each other in the clash between empires. In Russia, fears of uprising between the Ukrainian population quickly led on the 1st of August 1914 to the shutdown of all publication in Ukraine. Many cultural elites were either arrested or forced into exile. Russian authorities banned the Ukrainian language, as well as the Ukrainian institutions, like the Greek Orthodox Church. A new process of Russification started in Ukraine. In Austria, following the first Russian victories, Ukrainian population was subject to executions based on suspect of sympathy towards the Russians. In Syria, Austro-Hungarian authorities built a concentration camp the camp of Talerov, where also fire of Slavs were persecuted. However, not only Russian or Austro-Hungarian authorities persecuted the Ukrainians. In Canada, 84,000 Ukrainians were persecuted as aliens of enemy origin and identified as Austro-Hungarians. Ukrainians in the Austro-Hungarian Empire perceived the war as a way to achieve Ukrainian nation from the Russian territories. Thus, they started support of the Habsburg monarchy, 
with the formation of the first Ukrainian military units. Austro-Hungarian Ukrainians also started a campaign to convince and convert pro-Russian Ukrainians. In 1915, the Austrian counter-offensive, joined by German troops, stopped the Russification process, but led Ukrainian territories to suffer the war, becoming the front line. The advances in Galicia and Bukovina led to many Russophiles being pushed further towards Russian territories. In 1916, Russia manages to reconquer Bukovina and parts of Galicia, but the crops of the empire make it so that such conquests will not last long. In 1917, lack of food led to protests and mutinies in St. Petersburg. Once again, a revolution started in February 1917. Exhausted by years of war and suggested by the Duma, Nicholas II abdicated, passing the throne to his brother, who also abdicated, effectively ending the Romanov dynasty. The initial Duma gladly accepted the end of the monarchy, knowing that a new monarch would have just led to greater unrest. The Duma created a provisional government. The new government soon tried to put forward promises of continuation, especially in the conflict, in order to be recognized by the power of the Entente. The new government also started revoking the previous measures that had prevented the Ukrainians from expressing themselves, lifting the ban on the Ukrainian language and institutions and allowing the birth of many Ukrainian parties. This led in March 1917 to the formation of a Ukrainian parliament in Kyiv, the Central Rada. The reunion was held in the underground segment of the Museum of Pedagogy in Kyiv. The initial idea is to achieve the territorial autonomy, aiming at having a free Ukrainian federated democratic Russia. To make sure to encompass fully the Ukrainian population, the Rada held promises of presentation and rights to Polish, Russian and Jewish communities, as well as dividing the lands of the nobles between the people working it. Another major promise of the Rada regarded the war. In fact, while the provisional government kept fighting the central powers, the central Rada promised that the war for the Ukrainians would end. Thus, secret talks of peace were started. Ukrainian people, a people of peasant, workers, toilers. By your will, you have entrusted us, the Ukrainian central Rada, to guard the rights and freedoms of the Ukrainian land. Your finest son, who represents villages, factories, military barracks, Ukrainian communities and associations, have elected us. The Ukrainian Central Rada has ordered us to stand firm and defend these rights and freedoms. Your elected representatives have therefore expressed their will. Let Ukraine be free. Without separating from Russia, without breaking with the Russian state, let the Ukrainian people have the right to manage its own life on its own soil. Let the National Ukrainian Assembly, elected by universal, equal, direct and secret balloting, establish order and harmony in Ukraine. Only our Ukrainian Assembly has the right to establish law to provide order here in Ukraine. The Central Rada hoped that non-Ukrainian people living in our territory will also be concerned to maintain order and peace, and that in this difficult time of disorder in the entire state, they will join us in a united and friendly fashion to work for the organization of the autonomous Ukraine. However, the leading authorities in St. Petersburg made these promises hard to achieve. In November, the Bolsheviks in St. Petersburg managed to take over the provisional government, forming Soviets of workers and unifying the different parties under one single directive, and moving the capital from St. Petersburg to Moscow. Ukraine seemed like an obvious Bolshevik objective, seeing how the Rada was mostly formed by left-leaning parties, and the major party was the Ukrainian Socialist Revolutionaries. However, the government of the Rada did not recognize the authority of the Bolsheviks, and prevented the formation of Soviets in Kyiv due to the population support to the Rada. In the confusion and with the lack of experience of many Ukrainian leaders, the Ukrainian nation failed in creating an army. The Bolsheviks used their satisfaction with the Rada in eastern Ukraine to form the Soviets in Kharkiv and announced the creation of the Soviet Social Republic of Ukraine on the 25th December 1917, starting an offensive toward Kyiv. As a last act, the Rada declares Ukraine as a full independent nation in order to be recognized by central powers and to obtain military assistance against the Bolsheviks, now occupying Kyiv following the Rada leaving the city on the 9th of February 1918. Ukrainian people and all peoples of Ukraine, a heavy and difficult hour has fallen upon the land of the Russian Republic. 
in the capitals to the north, a bloody civil war struggle is raging. The central government has collapsed, and anarchy, lawlessness and ruin are spreading throughout the state. Our land is also in danger. Without a single strong national authority, Ukraine may also fall into the abyss of civil war, destruction and ruin. Ukrainian people, you together with the other fraternal people of Ukraine have entrusted us to guard the rights required through your struggles and to create order and build new life in our land. Therefore, we, the Ukrainian Central Rada, by your will and in the name of establishing order in our country and of saving all of Russia, proclaim from this day forth, Ukraine becomes the Ukrainian National Republic. On the 3rd of March, Ukraine and the Central Powers signed the Treaty of brest litovsk obtaining military support and political recognition in exchange for ore and food, a promise of about a million tons of grain. During the Bolshevik retreat, short-lived independent nations are born in the Ukrainian soil, such as the Popular Republic of Odessa, Tarida's Republic, or the Donetsk Kyiv Republic. The Austro German offensive was extremely successful, driving the Bolsheviks out of Ukraine, forcing them to flee to Kursk, where they secretly formed a new army and government supported by Lenin, now capable of forcing the Ukrainian communists to follow the de directives of Moscow. The Central Powers had agreed to aid the independent Ukraine in the hope to gain a nation which would provide them with food and coal to replenish their starving people and industry. However, the plans to exploit the newly independent People's Republic of Ukraine clash with the left-leaning socialist policies implemented by the Central Rada. Thus, on the 29th of April 1918, the Austro-German troops joined in a coup deposing the Central Rada and bringing to power General Pavlo Skoropatsky, ending any socialist policy and organizing militias and police to keep control over the state, aiming at supporting the urban classes of business owners as well as aristocrats. Skoropatsky proclaimed the Etmanate a role that did not exist since the purge made by Catherine I. Despite the critiques, during this period Ukraine manages to improve its institutions and create an actual army, as well as a centralized banking system. During the Etmanate, the Rada was essentially powerless, but different parties started to organize an opposition. However, on November 1918, the central power surrendered to the Entente. One after the other, they couldn't keep up with the conflict anymore, and thus the war ended. Soon the German Western troops retreated from Ukraine, leading the Etmanate to remain without any support. Fearing a Bolshevik attack and hoping in support of the Entente, Skoropatsky declared that once the Bolshevik would have been defeated, Ukraine would have been federalized back with a monarchist Russia. The parties of the opposition toppled this government, forcing the general to flee the country. However, without the armies of the Central Powers, the Bolsheviks restarted their attack on Ukraine, and in early 1918, Kyiv fell in their hands once more. Meanwhile, in Galicia, Ukrainian army units reorganized and conquered the city of Lviv, declaring the Western Ukrainian Republic. From the beginning, the Republic found itself in a war against Poland, from which the new Republic had conquered Galicia. The two Ukrainian republics soon declared shared goals. However, the conflict with Poland effectively made it so that the two republics acted more like allies than one nation even after the Act of Union. The victories in the West were short-lived. Alongside the French landing in Odessa on December 1918, the Allies had trained and sent to aid the fight against the Bolshevik 60,000 Polish troops. The Polish High Command soon sent them on the offensive against the West Ukrainian, denying most conquests and advancing deep into their territory. The French command protested, but the Polish answer was that those were not Ukrainian soldiers, but rather Bolsheviks. Adding to the conflict was the White Army, formed by Russians and Cossacks on the Don, led by General Denikin. While both nationalist Ukrainian and Whites were facing the same army, Denikin showed times and times again that the Ukrainian nation was to him a problem as much as the Bolsheviks were. Multiple times Ukraine offered to cooperate with the White Army, declaring their stated goal of defeating the Bolshevik. But often Denikin ignored them, and soon, once the Bolsheviks were out of the picture, the two armies faced strong in fighting. Multiple were the calls from Churchill pressing Denikin to cooperate with Ukrainians. 
One of the major and worst examples was the reconquest of Kyiv on the 31st of August 1919, when white armies and nationalists entered the city, but the Ukrainian nationalists retreated to avoid an all-out battle against the whites. Denikin does not only limit itself to avoiding helping the Ukrainian nationalists. He criticizes and, when possible, bans the teaching of Ukrainian language, as well as using propaganda to spread anti-Semitic messages, even against the wishes of the white high command. Worsening the already widespread Tsarist propaganda that started in 1905, during this period, the phenomenon of the pogroms became far too commonplace. Already spread through most of the crises, the Bolsheviks committed them while retreating in early 1918, the warlords committed pogroms without discrimination, the White Army had their troops being encouraged by Denikin. But it was mostly the nationalist of Petrura, despite his stance on the matter and actively punishing troops committing them, his army committed the majority of these atrocities. The final straw came with the key pogrom of 1919, the final nail in the coffin that broke the Jewish Ukrainian alliance, driving many young Jews in the Bolshevik forces of the Red Army. Between the ranks of the Red Army, Trotsky became a great leader and representative of the Jewish cause in the Red Army. Despite the problems, however, the pushes of the White Army seemed helpful, managing to give Ukraine back some land. However, it was not only the army participation that managed to push away the Bolsheviks. Many farmers and commoners opposed them due to their treatment as Russians instead of Ukrainians, as well as seizing the land just distributed to local farmers. Thus, the population itself ebbed in pushing away the Bolsheviks, a lesson which Lenin made sure to learn. In fact, the Red Army stance changed completely in 1920. They would speak to the Ukrainian in their own language, accept other leftist branches in their folds, especially in the Ukrainian, and nonetheless allow the Ukrainian farmers to keep their land, postponing plans for collectivization. Following the fall of Galicia to the Poles, the Ukrainians signed a peace treaty in April 1920, asserting the Poles conquest and requesting aid against the Bolsheviks, following multiple white defeats and the white expulsion from Ukraine in 1920. The Polish army, now aiming at creating a Ukrainian buffer state against the Russian Soviet Socialist Republic, agreed and started their offense, aiding the Ukrainian nationalists. The Soviet-Polish war began. The initial Polish-Ukrainian advance is soon halted and pushed back, all the way to Warsaw and Lviv, where the counter-offensive started on the 6th of May. It is believed that the final offensive of the Red Army failed due to them spreading vital units in on the front. In fact, a young Stalin suggested, possibly aiming to gain personal glory in the Red Army, that he could lead the cavalry assault against the city of Lviv and conquer it. The assault failed and, capable to further attack, the Soviets were pushed back into Ukraine. In October 1920, Poland and the Red Army signed a truce following 1991 into a peace treaty of Riga. The new reformed Soviet Social Ukrainian Republic signed a federal treaty with the Soviet Social Republic of Russia, slowly being absorbed, like many other Soviet Socialist Republics, into the USSR. Ukraine, much like many other nations in Europe, awakened and realized their potentials as a nation following the French Revolution. The already different culture of the Ukrainian people showed the need of the people of Ukraine to be recognized as Ukrainian first. In fact, even the more Russophiles Ukrainian often aim at a free Ukraine federated with Russia rather than accepting to be part of Russia. The conflict followed the same trend of many Euro other European nations. However, the failure of the independence can be seen in many factors. In choosing the central powers as allied, Ukraine had indeed protected itself from the Bolsheviks, but also accepted to become exploited by the two powers, firstly for resources, and thus was also tied to their downfall. Another major factor was the conflict with the Polish people. The conflict started already before the independence of the two nations, meant that the territorial ambitions between the two parties were already great and fueled by the former imperial overlord in order to make them weaker. Another factor was the incapacity of the Central Rada to form an army in the early stages of the independence, making the nation vulnerable and dependent on other armies for its defense. Last, but not least, the pogroms. While the original project of the Rada ensured safety to the Jewish people, they were between those groups that saw the most losses, and thus 
prefer to turn on the side of the Red Army for their own security. The intervention of the Allied powers in order of, to aid the White Armies also did not help. With their objective to reestablish a status quo, the Allies completely ignored the Ukrainian often, leaving them out of talks. So, while the people of Ukraine was mature enough to define itself as a nation, the combination of factor made it virtually impossible for them to maintain their independence. However, in 1991, alongside many other nations, Ukraine managed to claim their independence. Unfortunately, Russian ideas of the concept of nationalism created to protect the empire resurfaced under Putin's rule. And more and more again, we see an appeal to claim that Ukraine was never independent and never existed before 1991. As Putin did a few days ago, looking at an old 17th century map of Russia made in France, as if it could prove him right. I have more trust and hope that Ukraine will prove themselves capable of defending their nation. Not only the Ukrainian nations seem to be far more united and cohesive, but the international stage seems to actually be in their favor. Unlike the Ukrainian National Republic, modern Ukraine had time to build up infrastructure and strong institutions, as well as a capable army. I hope you enjoyed this video and that it proven to be interesting and educational. It took me some time to research, but it was very interesting. And I recommend everyone to go deeper than I did. In fact, I believe that maybe in the future, I do not know when, I will make more videos, more focused on singular events. But uh, it's really interesting. Ukraine and Eastern Europe in general has, has a long and interesting history, much like Western Europe, Central Europe, and every part of the world and it deserves attention. As always you can find all the sources in the description but before leaving I'll give you a list of books that I used for the research. Well the first one is uh, Seri Plocki, The Gates of Europe, A History of Ukraine. Then we have Gabriele Fagioni, Storia del conflitto russo ucraino al XVIII secolo ad oggi followed by Peter Kennett's Red Advance Wide Defeat, Civil War in South Russia, 1919-1920, and Paul Robert Magoshi, A History of Ukraine, The Land and Its People. If you liked the video, leave a like, and if you want more of my videos, why not subscribe? Hope you all have a wonderful continuation. See you all to the next video. Bye.